very uh, delighted to have you um, with us, Will. You, you need no introduction, but um, I did want to, of course, <laughs> one, of, <laughs> one of the reasons why we wanted to talk today was because of your new book, uh, which I believe is out in paperback just this week. Uh, yesterday, February, February, yes, yes. Yes, exactly. Um, so, um, and of course, in that, you you um, really chart a really detailed historical account of sort of what's been happening in Britain with the economy and politics, essentially, and, and how we might move to, onto a more progressive footing into the future, following, and obviously we're in the election period, so it's a good moment to talk about, about these issues. Thank you very much for joining us, Will. Um, I um, I think maybe, well, I think also the other thing that I just wanted to say by way of context is that I first um, met you in person at um, Anthropy, which was a conference in um Devon oh sorry Cornwall um last year um quite an interesting conference but where you were talking about food and think and thinking about all of the issues that you work on and in, in relation to food in particular and you talked quite a bit about Harold Macmillan as an interesting example of a politician that really grasped some of the difficult issues around food and health and so I, maybe we can start with that. You could perhaps tell us a little bit about your book, what lessons you think we can draw from it around the challenges we face around food and perhaps dive into a little bit on the story of Harold Macmillan in particular. Well, um, let me just go, uh, I'll, try, I'll, I'll do this very quickly because we only got till midday. Um, the one thing is that... Um, one of the things I have tried to develop in the book is that um, there's a, essentially my critique of the last 45 years is that we've been, um, uh, policy, economic policy and social policy has been organized around the notion that kind of essentially individuals uh, operating in markets will self-organize to best outcomes. And we can rely on people to make the right choices, um, whether it be over kind of <laughs> employment, investment, or actually what they eat. Um and uh, uh, my argument is, is that actually um, you need to kind of blend a commitment to individual responsibility and individual agency with notions of fellowship um, and solidarity, mutuality, having each other's backs, uh, combining an ethic of socialism, as I call it. Um, that's the ethic that embodies the notion of fellowship with progressive kind of liberalism, uh, where you're kind of acknowledging that we are individuals and we have individual aspirations and want ladders up which to climb, but there should always be a social floor. That's the ethic of socialism. And actually um, the sweet spot in any, in any kind of uh, kind of political philosophy is kind of to combine those two kind of traditions. And uh, I began to explore in the writing of the book, kind of thinkers over the last kind of couple of hundred years. And two things stood out, came out, kind of just kind of hit you between the eyes. Um, one is, is that actually um, that's where an awful lot of people before Will Hutton ever dreamt up of the idea have been thinking. It could be Richard Tawney in the 1930s. It could be, um, it, it could go back into the 19th century. It could be some of the great new liberal thinkers um, who were to give us canes and beverage, of course. Um, but it was also, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, you have to go from the 1870s onward, people began to get more and more concerned um, not only about disease, uh, but about nutrition. Um, and indeed, um, one of the reasons why Winston Churchill, who was a Tory, crossed the floor of the House of Commons in 1904 was because, A, um, we couldn't, uh, we ran a great empire, um, but we couldn't provide um, um, fresh water through water distribution systems to our people. And uh, our soldiers fighting in the Boer War um, were short and unhealthy. And actually, um, uh, it's all forgotten. But mm -hmm. in Manchester, for example, 14,000 men volunteered to fight in the Boer War. And the army could only you know, deploy 1,400 of them because the others were had terrible teeth, weren't strong, um, were short, um, couldn't actually carry a knapsack and a rifle. And into the First World War... Um, there was a major issue that actually British soldiers were kind of shorter and less healthy than their German counterparts. Uh, and one of the reasons why we were losing the war, because um, actually one of the things that's not spoken enough is that actually 
um, by um, the spring of 2015, after the um, 1915, after the failed Gallipoli campaign, I mean, Britain and France had lost the First World War. The Germans had made all the territorial gains. And it was one of the reasons that it was being advanced was that um, our, our armies were just unhealthy. Um, and so this question of um, nutrition and food um, became not just an issue for um, you know, thinkers on the on the liberal left, the, Fa the Fabians and, and the Labour Party, and uh, but it also began to intrude in the Conservative Party. And I read um, a book written by Harold Macmillan, who was to be Prime Minister, of course, in Britain in the 1950s, a great Tory, an Etonian, and a man who was five times wounded in the First World War. It's called The Middle Way. And he was trying to combine this notion of, you know, the, there's, uh, there's, the, there's the collective and there's the I, there's the social, there's the ethic of socialism, and there's the the, the progressive liberalism, and he uh, very, I mean, it's a book that's much more radical than anything I've written actually, written by a Tory, and had a lot of support in the Conservative Party at the time actually, but one of the things that's really extraordinary um, is the back part of the book has detailed tables in which he sets out as the MP for Stockton, which was part of the devastated northeast of England during the slump, um, uh, how much kind of new trip what the calorific intake should be um, of adults and children. And he wanted to establish a, a national nutrition board in which every local government in the country would be required to ensure that every citizen kind of had kind of a, um, appropriate food intake. He costed it and he, and there, there it was. And um, he, as he said, you know, if you want, if you want a functioning democracy, you want people to buy into democracy, not for prey to the temptations of socialism and communism, you've got to feed them. And, uh, you know, this, and, you, and, you, and actually the society, the social, the we, has to take responsibility for ensuring that our folk are pr properly fed. You can spool onward to 2023, 24. And, you know, and, and, and we all know um, the kind of the story, Henry Dimbleby's react, the reaction of the Tory party to Henry Dimbleby's very level-headed and sensible kind of recommendations about kind of sugar in food and, to excessive salt in food, the impact of junk food on obesity. Um, uh, the action was not, you know, um, the, the way the Conservative Party reacted to the middle way in 1938 was to say, you know, there's sense in this. And we've, if we don't talk this language, we will get punished in elections and we'll get punished in wars um, because, you know, our men and women can't fight. Um, you know, spill forward and you have a Conservative Party who kind of wholesale rejected a similar approach. Um, it's a nanny state. And I was very struck by it when uh, uh, Keir Starmer proposed his breakfast clubs. Um, and again, you know, the, the idea from the Tory party was that many people in the Tory party said, this is, this is taking away the responsibility for families to provide for their own children with no recognition of actually what life is like at the bottom of our, of, of, um, our society. And I should point out, and I'll finish off now because I'm sure you want questions, but actually, I mean, there's some very there's some extraordinary data which suggests that uh, that actually um, Britain has gone down the league tables since 1980 in the stature of our young of our kids. So that uh, the latest numbers show that we have the shortest five year olds in Europe, uh, and uh, that is without doubt kind of connected to nutrition. So I, you know, um, I, um, you know, I, I find my way into your agenda. Uh, <laughs> Anna, um, you know, a, a completely unexpected direction. I'm, I'm writing as a political economist. I'm writing as a, as a, uh, and actually, um, I'm, I'm, so I suppose, you know, to, to kind of the punchline is that I, I argue in the book for a, a, a we society to blend an ethic of socialism, provide a social floor in which nutritional standards are absolutely front and center, got it? Simultaneously, you have to recognize we're individuals with agency, but we have obligations to society of which we're part, but we want to have provide ladders of opportunity up, up which people can climb. And it's that bringing those two philosophies together kind of is, I think, the sweet spot, is what I think the Starmer government will try to do, I hope. I know Kieran is people quite well, that's the way he thinks. Um, and that actually, um, you know, there's a bridgehead there in these in the in the in these breakfast clubs, um, and actually the, the country's kind of horror at the kind of explosion of food banks around which Gordon Brown has written so kind of um, kind of you know 
we should open the same kind of um, way of thinking that actually Harold Macmillan had um, in 1938. And I think one of the reasons why um, the Conservative Party is in such political trouble um, is not just the Liz Truss, but actually the libertarianism which Liz Truss represented did fail in that budget, that famous budget. Um, and it's that libertarianism which saying, you know, um, society, government, local government should have absolutely kind of nothing to do with um, uh, you know, um, food standards. Uh, we shouldn't try to overregulate the food industry. Um, we shouldn't worry too, you know, we must let farmers get on with it. Uh, we we must let families decide on how they want to feed their children. Um, and if some kids go hungry, well, kind of, that's just too bad. That's the price you pay for a free society. And that doesn't wash with the British. And that kind of philosophy is actually, I think, costing them dear. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Um, so there's a lot in there. Um, I think just to your point about height is, is well made. In fact, yesterday, we a uh, children's height, um, we published um, a report called A Neglected Generation, which was actually compiling these trend data of children's height, obesity levels, healthy life expectancy and type 2 diabetes amongst children and adolescents and uh, uh, young adults. Um, basically showing that over the last two decades, those graphs have all gone in the wrong direction. Um, and um, interestingly, there was a, a piece in The Telegraph today, which was written by um, Jemima Lewis, Henry Dimbleby's partner, um, commenting on the report and specifically referencing um, the point that you just made about the Boer War. Um, so and, and <laughs> I had to, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think she may they may have read the book. Um, Probably. Um, I, I myself, I myself, I, until I was doing the research, I had no idea that this was such a live issue at the turn of the century. I mean, literally, um, sewers, sanitation, nutrition were the reason why Winston Churchill went from being a conservative to a liberal in 1904 and stayed a liberal for 20 years. And one of the reasons why... Um, the uh, uh, Attlee and Arthur Greenwood were so keen that he should lead the country um, and, as, and they kind of run up to the disaster of Dunkirk um, was because he, they thought he was the only Tory who got the Labour agenda. You right. know, um, I mean, uh, Winston I mean, Trump, I think the yeah, very well, the other... guy, actually. I mean, kind of... <laughs> the other point I wanted to make was that she um, she referred to this report that was issued after the Boer War, reflecting on the poor quality of the fighting force, if you like. Um, and it was produced by the Interdepartmental Committee of Physical Deterioration. <laughs> <It was> absolutely <laughs> brilliant name. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, I think in, in her piece, it's interesting because she also then talks about, well, are we just going to solve this through anti-obesity drugs and Wegovy? Is that really the only thing we've got up our sleeves? Um, well, so it's, so, a, it's, it's, a, it's a tool for the extreme obese, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, I, and she makes that point, but I'm not for children, not for a two thirds of, of uh, well, a third of children. Um, so obviously, <laughs> no, um, no. yeah. So, I, and maybe we should then touch on to the, some of the, you made some of the points about you know the breakfast clubs from Labour and the Conservatives. We've done now um, quite a detailed analysis. Joss and my team has done a quite a detailed analysis of all the the manifestos um, in relation to our Food Foundation manifesto, which we set out towards the end of last year with our sort of um, hopes for what we think ought to be included. Um, and it's it's an interesting picture. Um, there are obviously some elements which align well. You mentioned um, Breakfast Clubs for Labour, but um, we've been particularly focusing on trying to get free school meals expanded. Um, and the Liberal Democrats are the ones that really, and the Green Party make a sort of strong commitment around free school meals. Um, but um, the, the, you, you mentioned the point about the Conservatives sort of saying, let the farmers um, get on with it. But in fact, in the Conservative manifesto, there's quite a lot about, um, which I think is really trying to respond to the crisis that farming is in at the moment, yep. around yep. setting a sort of target for national 
food security. So there's something in there which is about there's a quite a strong and a very strong emphasis actually across all the political parties on um public procurement and getting more British food into the food supply, um, particularly in our public setting, schools and hospitals and so forth. So that's kind of well covered and actually feels very uncontested across the political spectrum. Um, but as you say, the extent to which the political parties are willing to start to sort of intervene in the more um, food industry behaviour is is very variable, though they all actually reiterate, or most of them reiterate their commitment to introducing tighter regulations for advertising of junk food to children. Um, but I was I wanted to pick up a little bit more on that angle in terms of the food industry, because you've done a huge amount of work on thinking about what good company, what 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 the the regulation should be around companies in general to ensure that they contribute better outcomes to society. And this is this is so important in food. Um, and you all work with the Purposeful Company in particular. Sure. Um, and this, I don't see this these issues widely reflected in the manifesto. So the Liberal Democrats do talk about <clears throat> reforming fiduciary duty and company purpose rules um, so that large companies do have to have a a statement of corporate purpose, um, which is interesting and could be quite a significant step in the right direction um, uh, on um, food, because if you were requiring food companies to actually set out a purpose, a wider community value, um, that would be interesting. And the, the other thing I wanted to know, because I'd love to hear your reflections on that, and also another thing which appears only, I believe, in the Liberal Democrat manifesto, which is... Um, they say that they want to expand the sugary drinks tax, but they want to, sorry, not that they, they forget that. They say that they want to expand free school meals. And to do so, they want to use uh, tax um, share buybacks in the FTSE 100 um, to generate the revenue needed to pay for that, which we thought was kind of interesting because there's been quite a lot of evidence compiled now around ultra processed food companies and these share buybacks being a really significant trend in sort of um, creating very profitable companies which are increasingly becoming more removed from their core job of pro providing nutritious foods. Um, Benjamin Wood's done some really interesting analysis of this, a really interesting paper he's written on that. Um, but anyway, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Where are we going with respect to purposeful companies? Where do you see the political agenda evolving in that space? Well, I mean, I... Look, I mean, uh, <laughs> um, I don't overclaim actually, but I think uh, you know a number of Lib Tem kind of people over the last two or three years have been in touch with me and my and the team at the personal company uh, on this um, uh, on this uh, on this insistence that uh, you're just going to rebias our capitalism um, around. Uh, the pursuit of long-term purpose, a kind of stakeholder approach, really, um, from which you set out to make money. I mean, there's not, you're not saying, you know, that enterprise shouldn't be kind of profit-seeking, um, but you're saying that it's 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 hunger, it's search, it's quest for profitability, which be in the context of pursuing a great a great purpose. Um, and this is, I mean. Uh, we need another seminar actually on this because it's very, I mean, it's very complicated. I mean, there are some sectors and some companies who lean into this agenda more than others. They tend to be ones which are consumer facing for obvious reasons. Um, or interestingly, um, whose business model is kind of about problem solving, using knowledge, using intellectual capital, using R&D at the frontier of technology. Uh, they tend to be very purpose driven. But I would be, I mean, I was very struck by um, the Lib Dems, you know, I could, could they, went, they go a little bit further, I think, than, than, than you suggest. In this respect, they they do think that the um, water companies and all the regulated utilities should incorporate as public benefit companies. And so they should kind of declare in their constitution, their articles of association, that they're, that they're on earth to deliver, you know, clean, cheap water, um, some, a parallel thing in energy. And I, I, I mean, I think you could extend that principle to food manufacturing and farming, actually. Mm -hmm. 
I think that, um, uh, I mean, the difficulty is, and George Monbiot has written well on this, that too much of the kind of world food industry is is in the hands of, you know, I mean, actually, UK food manufacturers are kind of subordinate, really, to the kind of big and multinational players. The, the way the grain trade is dominated by kind of three, four kind of massive combines. Um, so I, I, one might need an international effort on that. But we can start. We can make a start. And I would actually like to see, um, uh, I, I, I slightly fight shy of the, there's a, the, the, many people on the call will know about the, the B Corps, which are, are kind of a way of um, kind of getting this public benefit idea over. Um, I'm not certain about B Corps. Um, there's not time to explain why I'm not certain. But um, I think that the Food Foundation um, should be arguing for um, this principle of um, public benefit being kind of actually integral to uh, food companies' constitutions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it should be. I think I think it should be part of your your own manifesto. Mm. Um, and I think you should. And I think if the Lib Dems do well in the election, and the sixty seventy of them get back in the House of Commons. Um, and there'll be there'll be a lot of sympathizers in, the, in labor ranks. There could easily be a majority in the House of Commons to kind of legislate and regulate around these principles. So uh, you know, that's my. I mean, there's much more to be said. You've got to get shareholders to agree that. Uh, so food companies have got to get shareholders who align with that. That's a, and that's the, we have to. That maybe that we have to re reform our pension funds and and get um, big meta funds um, who are happy to put. A proportion of their assets in kind of what will naturally be kind of um, there'll be good companies in which to invest but they won't be go-go companies i mean they're going to be a kind of stable investment in which will whose dividends will grow gradually over time they won't be kind of um so you know you need it's a there's a and to get to that destination you have to kind of in parallel with your moves on company law you have to think about Kind of refashioning and repurposing the, the the saving system. Um, British pension funds don't invest enough in British equity. The only two percent of pension fund assets, UK pension fund assets, is actually in British shares. So if we want them to have, more, if, we, if we if we want our voice through our pension funds to kind of kind of express um, our view on what the strategy should be of the big companies which we kind of you know provide us goods and services we need to be owners of them to more to a greater degree than we are um yeah. so there's a lot to be done but i think the the, the the starting off point is actually um to 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 uh, really require um food manufacturers um to incorporate around around public benefit principles yeah yeah so, yeah uh, my 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 mobile's getting mad here. I'm I'm just trying to silent. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I'm, I'm conscious that we've we've hit time um and, and we 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 managed to lose five minutes at the beginning and I'm I'm sorry for if you are you able to can you carry on for another five minutes? Five more minutes. Please, and I'm a, I've got another call at five past twelve, so I'm sorry. Okay. I'm yeah, yeah. Let's keep going for for five more minutes if that's okay. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about you talk you touched on this a little bit in your in your introduction um about the we and the I, and I feel that this is such such a helpful uh, way of thinking about these issues with respect to food, because one of the challenge, the narratives that we're trying to challenge, and you've touched on it, is this whole idea that what you eat is um, entirely up to you, you're in, in control of your own destiny, this is personal responsibility, um, and it's not the job of the state to get involved. Um, but at the same time, we know that food is um, so important for our social lives and for how we um, show that we love one another when we eat together. And it's part, it's sort of an integral part of community. And I'm just sort of in, I just like to hear your thoughts on the sort of we and the I thing with respect to food. It feels like it's where that distinction really becomes very sharp well uh, um <laughs> uh, um i do think um that uh now 
getting the words right here are important because you know that um i do think that um uh families that eat together hang together um and i i think that we've um and i i i, I do think that um one of the ways of I think it's important for men and women to kind of recontract with each other um, over this particular dimension of family life. Um, because, you know, um, women who work are under as much pressure as men and asking them to kind of take the lead role in buying, cooking or thinking about food is kind of unreasonable. And I do think I'm, I'm not sure to what extent young men are kind of in the space where they recognize the importance of actually you know you your partner and your kids sitting down at table together and actually um and actually uh when i was being brought up you know um leaving the meal before the end you know you had to ask permission to do it it was understood that that was not the thing you did and at the time i found it as a 10 year old extremely irritating and i couldn't go listen to the radio or return to my homework whatever it was but actually co communal family eating is incredibly important and it's true of course of friendship you know i mean eating and drinking is a uh, together is one of the ways that you know we we um we express our socia our sociability i mean i mm. in my book i talk about i quote a number of great philosophers over the centuries who've made this point starting with aristotle and it was uh, Aristotle, who famously said um, that the the man or woman um, who does not want to partake of the common life and be part of society is either a beast or a god, and I want no part with either. Um, and actually, you know, um, there's now a kind of uh, economists and political economists have begun developing We've, we've, I, I, people on the call will know about economic man there's also homo kind of you know they're kind of um you know homo economica there's a new one actually there's the, the kind of ultra socialist man <laughs> or woman and you know people are beginning to the penny is dropping that actually you know we individuals are social beings and here again you know i mean um i don't overdo it uh, but i i you know, I, I I do think that you know, understanding about the ceremony of eating, and um, kind of the importance of there being kind of moments in a day. I always make sure I share breakfast with my partner, and I always make sure that we we kind of we we try to eat together. At, and you know, to the extent our adult children, kind of are still around the place, they try and join us. So it's very very important. Uh, I'm not sure I live by my own by my own compass, but that's what I believe. Thank you, Will. Um, we're out of time, but um, it's been wonderful to talk to you. I've learned a lot. I knew I would. Um, and um, uh, we'll be to, to everyone that's listening. We'll obviously be circulating the recording um, to listen back to. Um, lots of people prefer to listen to these that way. Um, there were a few questions that appeared in the chat that we've not addressed. I, I may ping them to you, Will, yeah. at some point yeah. on email, and we might be able to follow up with people if you've got views that you'd like to share on those. But congratulations on the book. And, Thank you. Um, here, it here it is. Here it is. There it's, it's, I've got it here as well. It's actually, <laughs> <laughs> I've got it here too. <laughs> um, and uh, have a good day, everyone. And thanks again, Will, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Big, big things today. Big, big take. The take home thoughts are one. Kind of nutrition is uh, the quintessential expression of the we. We've got to take care of what we collectively eat. Kind of two, everyone involved in the production and distribution of food has to take that social obligation fundamentally seriously. And we, as far as possible, should require people to, producers to write it into their constitutions and their articles of association. And point three, we as individuals should kind of um, recognize kind of that the importance of eating uh, is a social act. Thank you. Brilliant takeaways. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. On that note, thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.